Hi, everybody. It's another episode of my show exclusively at Rockfin. I'm Max Blumenthal, and I'm probably introducing myself was completely pointless because you know who I am. I have a great guest today, Chris Mott, who's a research fellow at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, uh, two things that are basically off limits in official Washington, peace and diplomacy. And we're going to talk about one reason why they're increasingly off limits. I was actually noticing today that Tony Blinken was meeting with Carlos Vecchio, the fake ambassador to Venezuela who controls absolutely no government institutions. And so he's met with him more times than he's met with Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia in 2022, a uh, leader of a nuclear armed power that the West is currently engaged in a dangerous conflict with. Um, and I think this conversation will be pertinent to that. Chris Mott has written a very provocative paper, a white paper. Um, I'll throw it up on screen before we discuss it. I think it's whatever you think about this whole con the whole concept of wokeness. I, I actually don't like to use that term, but it's become this this byword for social justice and what the U.S., particularly under the Biden administration, is becoming beginning to export. Um, it's very clear that this this tendency, this sort of cultural political tendency, is being merged with neoconservatism. Um, and so Chris's paper addresses that. It's called Woke Imperium, the Coming Confluence Between Social Justice and Neoconservatism. And it was published at the Institute for Peace and Democracy, whose motto is challenging the conventional rethinking foreign policy. So Chris, uh, welcome to the show and welcome everybody. To be here. What, what, what prompted you to write this provocative and in, in my view, very on point essay and tell us a little bit more about the research institute that you're working for. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> well, in the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy is a relatively recent and new think tank that uh, tries to employ people um, who are, you know, can very much speak with the foreign policy establishment and and use their lingo and, and have connections with them, but also is really interested in challenging that establishment and right. uh, is really interested in looking at alternatives. We're definitely part of the same realism and restraint movement that, say, Quincy Institute is part of. Um, and we're also based in jointly in Canada and the U.S. So we, we tend to focus on like North Atlantic as opposed to just the U.S. when we talk about things and certain tropes that have wormed their way into North Atlantic foreign policy that we kind of want to change. Um, so that's that's kind of our deal. We have a bunch of different things. Um, I'm co-author on another very large white paper that came out a few months ago called the Middle Powers Project, uh, which is actually uh, taking the relatively mundane observation that we're moving in clearly into a multipolar world and uh, upping its game a bit by saying that, no, it, this doesn't just mean it's the U.S. and Russia and China back in, uh, as people talk about, it doesn't mean it's a new cold war it doesn't mean anything like that it just means that um, it means in fact that what you're going to see is there's a lot of overlooked countries out there particularly kind of medium level middle power pro uh, countries that are getting overlooked and that diplomacy is going to have to readjust to not just be this great power uh, competition but also take in mind that there are certain regional countries that are just going to matter a lot more uh so we do we do kind of you know unconventional things as to why I wrote Woke Imperium itself, our most recent white paper, that actually goes back quite a bit. Uh, um, I first had the idea, though not the term for the idea, um, about almost exactly, maybe slightly more than 10 years ago, um, when the Coney 2012 campaign became really, really big in social media, and there were a lot of like internet activism, and then you know, paint the night, uh, putting up posters everywhere. Catch Coney, it's our job to catch the the, the Ugandan yeah. warlord of the Lord's Resistance Army, Joseph Coney. Um, and this became like a huge uh, cause that burned out almost as fast as it arose. But the there was clearly in the how viral it went. There was clearly this very strong intention uh, by uh, it, 
people who behind the project to whip up support. And then this was noticed, I think, in turn by certain state actors who saw, oh, we're we're over the Bush era, we're over the, you know, the the, the kind of uh, Christian nationalist slash neoconservative alliance and 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 clearly the way into young people's hearts is through social justice activism to get them to effectively support what was I think uh, viewed by the Obama administration as an opportunity to expand um, the the uh, the the U.S. defense connections with countries in Central Africa. So that I think was kind of why they looked at that and they said, oh, this this might be a pretty good idea. And just watching that whole thing play out as it rose and then it fell, and then the, the front man had a naked meltdown in the public on the, on the street um, when he got That's criticized. All. Oh, well, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Basalts were all the rage in uh, media uh, coverage of the 2012, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, that was that was such a um, it was that was happening too when I was a uh, postgraduate student. I was living in the UK at the time, and it was just as big of a thing in the UK as it was in the US. And so it was kind of noticing this, noticing how easily it was to kind of manipulate you know millennials my generation more on this like clearly millennials grew up you know with a either in the middle of the tail or the tail end of bush and i think had hardened their cynicism towards things coming from the right that were advocating for these types of policies but they kind of left their left flank open a bit and so when i saw that I immediately thought like, oh God, this is the future, isn't it? Like I had this immediate realization that Coney 2012 was the harbinger of things to come in terms of a lot of foreign policy commentary and activism. And so I've always had my mind on that. I mean, that isn't what I was there to study and that's not actually the focus of what I do even today. Yeah. But it, it's something that I've always had my, uh, I've always been attuned to and it reached a certain point um, a couple of years ago where it just became like, oh, it's undeniable now. Like, I've, yeah, I've been paying attention to this, but it's obscure enough that when I bring it up, people kind of say, oh, that's not a real big deal. Or people really won't fall for that. Or, um, you know, it, it's, they're just trying it out, but it might not go anywhere. But it became particularly strong um, in the last few years. And so I just, I said, uh, I, I brought it up to IPD actually, and, and I hadn't even been working for IPD for more than maybe six, seven months at this point. And so I knew it was kind of risky because it's not like most of what we do. We're very grand strategy focused. We're very like hard geopolitics focused. And so am I, most of my publication is like that too. And so I was like, <laughs> um, you know, I know you're probably going to say no, but I have this idea for this thing uh to kind of study this convergence of like social justice activism and kind of hawkish foreign policy views and i think it's important because i think we're clearly seeing the foreign policy establishment pivot in that direction so when we get into debates with people we need to have the arsenal on our side to kind of disarm their talking points too but also to notice this very real trend and to my surprise they said yes. And in, in fact, our research director, uh, Arthur Molini, uh, became a huge champion of the project. Like immediately he was like, I love it uh, and, and proceeded to support me quite strongly. And so it became uh, a, a relatively long project because I had to take time off to work on middle powers and do other things. But over the course of five, six month period, you know, working on it part time, I, I came upon enough examples and enough things that happened that I could build a narrative, uh, not just starting in history, uh, but connecting history to the present day and also some ideas as what the future might bring too. Well, the Coney 2012 seems to be the moment you notice this trend and I definitely noticed it too. I mean, Coney 2012, as you mentioned, it, it was exposed as kind of a, 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 not only a psyop, but sort of a sham, I think it was cover for a wider agenda of increasing AFRICOM's footprint in Central Africa and using this kind of um, humanitarian issue to actually deepen US military involvement. It was at a time when Boko Haram was also running wild, but that itself was a ricochet effect, uh, Boko Haram of the failed or disastrous, it might've actually been successful if you, depending on how cynically you look at it, 
Obama's intervention in Libya or the NATO intervention in Libya. And you had the broader narrative of the Arab Spring, which flowed from the Obama administration and specifically people like State Department Policy Planning Director Anne-Marie Slaughter, Samantha Power, who's features in the in the card of the featured card of this show who's sort of the godmother of humanitarian interventionism or at least uh, one of the most effective salespeople these these people all had key positions in the Obama administration to market this I don't know if you want to call it an ideology but this sort of tendency within foreign policy circles of humanitarian interventionism which relied on uh, sort of a wokest narrative to, to promote it. Wouldn't you say the Arab Spring was sort of the pivot point where the war on terror essentially had ended and the war on terror was uh, Bush, you know, first term Bush era narrative marketed towards uh, conservatives, which who later became the base of the MAGA movement and Donald Trump. And the Obama administration began to introduce this with the Arab Spring. We need to save these children from these authoritarian dictators who also happen to be uh patriarchal figures who had um, hard, hard man fathers. Yeah, no, I think the Arab Spring is a really important moment in, in the evolution of this process, though I do think the evolution of this process is in a way intrinsic to a lot of American history and, and in fact predates the founding of the country in a lot of ways. Um, right. in, in my historical uh, section, I taught, I name dropped the Puritans. If I had been able to dump more on the history, I probably would have actually written a lot about the 17th century because I feel that there is quite a lot um, there and it has been traveling in the Anglo-American world ever since. Um, this kind of tendency to, to reduce local complexity in exchange for a grand universal teleological narrative that ends with, you know, the rapture or <laughs> whatever, <laughs> the end of history, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think in particular, you saw the shift from the kind of um, American, the new American century, if you will, um, into and away from the war on terror, which also used this very clash of civilization -y nar uh, narrative in a lot of it, uh, into this very much human rights focused narrative under the responsibility to protect the R2P doctrine as was originally formulated by Samantha Power uh, when right. she was an academic. Um, and so you have this, uh, yeah, it, I think the pivot is in the aftermath of the Arab Spring in particular. And you, you see this clear desire to intervene, although there is a certain reluctance there as well. Um, on Obama's part, but he was in the end, it was his decision and he chose to do it. So he does bear responsibility for it. But as we know now, power, um, slaughter and power, the iconically named duo um, and Hillary Clinton and a few other people in his administration were pushing for the Libya intervention. And so was Britain and France, by the way. I mean, Britain and France more, I would say, than even anyone in the US on some level. And right. they- For their they, own colonial reasons neo-colonial reasons I mean. well france in particular i think there's definitely a, yeah. an economic argument to be made with the countries they have influence with that are close to libya etc um but yeah uh it's uh, david cameron just has this amazing ability uh had i guess this amazing ability to just do everything everything wrong um no matter what so uh that th we could explore that one as a separate topic but um uh it, it's just this operation, of course, it seemed to go like, well, in the early stages, there weren't, there wasn't a need for troops. Um, there were enough people on the ground that people could sell this, this popular uprising, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the point is, it was clearly shown immediately in the aftermath that there was no post-war plan whatsoever. They really just wanted to take out Gaddafi. And so the humanitarian aspect of it, which was explicitly invoked, including by claiming that Gaddafi was uh, doping up, if that's the word, his soldiers with Viagra to commit right. mass rape. Um, right. Really strange claims uh, that were never substantiated. Right. And, so that was introduced by, I think, Susan Rice at the UN. Um, and uh, UN officials then went on to re repeat it. And it was based on a, I think we traced it to an Al Jazeera report, Al Jazeera being Qatar's uh, international broadcaster. Qatar had a major interest in Libya and they sourced it to 
a faceless, nameless woman in the opposition who just simply said, they're raping us and they've all been given Viagra. So it all came down to just a complete lie. Um, here's Nicholas Kristoff, by the way. Thank you, America. Americans are not often heroes in the Arab world, but as nonstop celebrations unfold here in the Libyan capital, I keep running into ordinary people who learn where I'm from and then say fervently, thank you, America. So this is the, this, these are the delusional, I mean, this is a window into the delusional mindset coursing through the liberal interventionist circles along the Acela corridor. And you elucidate in your paper how dangerous this kind of thinking is because we see what happened to Libya, open air slave camps, ISIS taking over Gaddafi's hometown of Sirte, uh, Al-Qaeda taking over other areas. The country is still destabilized and divided. It's been a nonstop disaster. And yet, I mean, as you illustrate, this kind of thinking still dominates foreign policy circles, at least on the democratic side. And I think you're right. There is an element of Protestantism to it. Let me read, uh, I guess, one of the key phrases from your piece. It remind, I mean, this could be also said about manifest destiny internally in the United States. Yeah, the new... The new woke face of American hegemony and projects of empire is designed to project the U.S. as an international moral police rather than a conventional great power. And the result is neo-imperialism neo with a moral face. Yeah. Um, maybe <laughs> you can extrapolate something or you can articulate a little bit more about what you mean there because um, this is something that could have been said about the neocons in the Bush administration, but I think we have something slightly different at play here, slightly more extreme and even more unfamiliar to the cultures where the U.S. is inter intervening. Yeah, no, I think um, what you have after the Arab Spring and the inability to kind of confront the issue uh, because all the kind of media and political actors that supported the war didn't want to talk about it once the state collapsed because the humanitarian situation obviously deteriorated immensely and what was by some standards africa's most developed country uh became an absolute hellscape and so how yeah. can you justify any of that under a humanitarian pretext and then of course they were gearing up to do a more a much more stealthy much more cautious shall we say obama style uh intervention in syria also on similar grounds yeah. and so there was i think another pivot occurred because just human rights wasn't quite what we have now in in terms of rhetoric uh it, that was more in line with the typical stuff that we had seen in clinton and bush administrations and whatnot kind of post-cold war um stuff i think you what you really start to see and i think in particular once trump is president and a lot of the foreign policy establishment rallies against him of course not when he bombed syria that one time then they all rallied for him but um in general they rallied against him and they they took this kind of uh what i would say like radical liberal critique of the, that is often applied to his domestic policies. And I think they started to really double down on that element, combining it with the R2P element uh, that had already existed in the foreign policy establishment. Oh, I think you're still muted. Sorry. Yeah, you could, I think, I think you could also call it imperial intersectionality. Yeah, you could. <laughs> um, and, and I think it was a way of showing the U.S., it, both to a domestic audience, oh, the U.S. is still like good and cares. And like we haven't changed that much from the Obama administration, even with, you know, this guy in charge of uh, foreign policy. But it was also a way to signal, I think, to allied states that like we have a mission that isn't just being this hegemonic power. We have this kind of values driven mission. Of course, the problem, I mean, this might be getting ahead of myself a bit, but the problem is that this ideology just not work very well outside of a very specific set of countries we're right. literally talking countries that talk uh that border the north atlantic ocean <laughs> um that have kind of shared germanic anglo-saxon cultural connections um and of which i would i would include plenty of eurozone countries in that as well but like not in southern europe or eastern europe but you know just like in northern europe and so there's this very strong kind of like, oh, yes, America is the best option because only America cares about minorities, only America does whatever. Now, this this also creates this weird, unstable narrative uh, because a big part of 
like social justice rhetoric around today and domestic politics is kind of about how America is this uniquely evil country <laughs> that right. has this like intense historical guilt. But so I, I can already hear a lot of people saying, I, I spelled out in the report, but I could see a lot of people who just read the, the summary could be saying like, well, how does that work, right? Like they, these are the same people that are like reading white fragility and like talking about how they're born inherently with like racism, like the it's the mark of chain, like inverted or whatever. And, but it's actually quite easy to see because if you are uniquely uh, a self-flagellant, if you will, if you are like, look how guilty I am, I'm just so guilty, I need to be punished, like that type of worldview, it's very easy to see how you could turn that around and say, we have this important historical reckoning and we're having it with our past and we really encourage other countries to do the same thing. And of course, if other countries don't do the same thing, of course, because every country has a different history, every country has a different cultural context, has different, uh, you know, problems with, uh, you know, various minority groups within it. Um, this, it's it's just, it's an open door in a way to criticize another country's domestic politics on the international level. And the more, you know, the more guilty and virtuous you appear, the more I think you can argue that point. And we kind of see this like with uh, Linda Thomas Grenfeld in, in the, uh, the, the UN ambassador currently, when she was speaking before, I, I referenced in the piece, but I did not bring up the, uh, the exact link, but she literally talks about the 1619 project and its lessons can be applied to other countries. Its lessons can be applied around the world. And it's like, well, coming from the US foreign policy mm. establishment, I think we kind of know what that might mean. And, and I'm not necessarily saying that this is going to be like regime change style invasion. I actually think that that so far anyway, fingers crossed, seems to be on the way out. But you do see just sanctions and sanctions and sanctions, endless economic interference, endless um, uh, just kind of like, oh, you can't have full diplomatic relations with that country because they do X, Y, and Z. It, it's just kind of used to uphold the status quo. Because they were right? founded on oppression. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, by the logic of these same people, so were we. And I mean, technically, you could make the case that every country is on some level. So I, I just, yeah, it's, but it's, it's a narrative that is very much meant to universalize the American experience. And in this way, it is 100% the ideological descendant of um, things, whether it be Manifest Destiny, the, the kind of the, the Puritan uh, desire to spread religion, um, Woodrow Wilson's concept of world politics, um, and of course, uh, above all, I think the most immediate connection is George W. Bush's uh, concept of foreign policy. Uh, and, and it's just kind of the left version of that in a weird way. And which is why it's so easy for so many people who were, um, who were kind of like the Democrats that voted for the Iraq war to jump on board with this stuff. Well, I, I think what we're talking about here is the, the organized left in the U.S., the institutional left uh, being co-opted. And then having its its language and signals filtered through the marketing department of the CIA and the Pentagon and used to project American exceptionalism abroad uh, using the very arcane and bizarre language that's become predominant in the left, where Latinos are now Latin X, uh, you know, X's are inserted in all sorts of areas now. I believe um, amongst Latinos that that convention of inserting the X has about like 5% popular support. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's very unfamiliar to most people, but that's not the point. I mean, first of all, the, the left, the organized left has a real feeling of Protestantism and to speak that language puts you in a kind of priesthood where you are enlightened and then your job is to basically speak to the unenlightened masses, this language of um, holy tolerance and people reject it. It's not just the people reject it outside of the Anglo West. It's people, people are rejecting it all across the U S I mean, oh, you're yeah. seeing uh, this panic within the democratic party where more and more Brown and black people are turning towards Trumpism. I mean, in very small numbers, but they're, yeah. They're moving but that away. shouldn't be happening by their own logic. If, they're, if they're alienated. Fun. Ilhan Omar was booed in front of a Somali American audience at a Somali concert in Minnesota recently. It has a lot to do with that, along with her embrace of interventionist policies in the Horn of Africa, which is a separate issue. But I, I kind of I want to you know go back to your paper 
because you you nail this, I think. Um, and you write that elite overproduction has increased the pool of humanities graduates beyond society's ability to employ them. And this perfectly describes the the organized left of all these all these people who are, speak the language of Judith Butlerism, uh, are overeducated and underemployed. Um, many of them supported Bernie Sanders. They really want their student debt relieved and they can't mm -hmm. pay it off. It therefore becomes necessary for the class of applicants to demonstrate their ability to work within the language, not just of academia generally, but also of obscurantist jargon so prevalent within postmodernist schools of philosophy. American intelligence agencies, which once had a role in influencing a formerly class-based left opposition, and molding it into one of safely middle-class cultural revolution finds this process quite natural. And I mean, you said so much there because um, you're not only commenting on the professional managerial class that is helping to direct as part of the millennial generation moving into the foreign service and the state department and even the white house and beyond in the, the Pentagon helping to direct the empire, but you're also talking you're, you're, you're also kind of referring to the Congress on Cultural Freedom of Gloria Steinem, which infiltrated the left and moved it away from class struggle and was literally being paid by the Central Intelligence Agency. Now it's done through foundations, which I could talk about for the next two hours. But I think um, you nailed it there. So how, how do you, I, I mean, it, I, what, what more can you say about this and how is a professional managerial class that is largely progressive influencing the marketing of American empire. And I, I guess, um, you know, the decisions it makes as well. Yeah. Well, shout out to Catherine Liu. Um, but uh, I definitely would say that this is how actually the woke Imperium is not different from other hawkish foreign policy positions in the past, because uh, it was my point to, to, point out that this is a process that always happens. So whatever is very popular with the kind of up and coming administrative class is going to be on some level proportionally assimilated into the foreign policy establishment. Right. This has been other things in the past and it will be other things in the future. So um, in this case, this is more continuity than difference. Um, and uh, I think specifically what we're seeing is that yeah um as i've said also you know this is kind of based off of some thought from peter turchin as well but it's something that i've noticed being an ex-academic myself there is this tendency to uh for a lot of people to go into the humanities um sometimes proportionally speaking not all of them have like the world's strongest uh <laughs> kind of critical uh thinking chops mm -hmm. but there's a way to act like you do have them and that is to adopt a certain jargon from a certain ideology which just relativizes everything into oblivion which anyone can do and anyone can sound smart doing if they have the right vocabulary to back up that process so um this is generally my view of like postmodern philosophy in general but like <laughs> i think that's the role that it plays and why it's so readily embraced by the establishment um, and, and has been, I think, since, I don't know, probably since the 1990s on some level. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying that everything in postmodernism is wrong, because I would actually describe myself, I think there is a key difference between the humanities and the science. I don't think it's a binary, true, and false. And, and, and I actually do think that there is a lot of relativism. I think rel there's more relativism than there is certainty in anything. But um, to just reduce everything to a state of relativism, which is what I believe the postmodern project effectively does. And even if that's not its intention, that is what it does because it attracts so many midwits and that's all they can do. But like the idea is to effectively say, well, everything is quote unquote problematic. And therefore like there isn't a clear, there aren't really clear options aside from doubling down into individual experience and individual kind of uh, issues. Now, this obviously serves a domestic use and that it, it could obviously be used as a wedge against, say, for example, like union activity. Um, but I think on the foreign policy sphere, it really serves the kind of liberal Atlantic establishment, because if they're adopting increasingly this almost responsibility to protect based around individual rights, then they always want to be able to say, well, you know, the more 
all cultures are different and that's great, but you know, only the ones that respect difference like we do at the truly individual level uh, can, can be more legitimate states and more legitimate actors when it comes to uh, diplomatic things. So I think that's like the purpose it serves. Um, whereas the internal class purpose it serves, I think is merely to, they have a huge pool of potential recruits. They only have so many spaces they're gonna fill. So it's a really good way of determining who is the better potential like uh, more, you know, toe the line employee in a lot of cases, because who's willing to jump through the ideological hoops to show how interesting they are. And maybe if you're extra creative, you can show how radical you are on certain identitarian issues while still being firmly within the establishment, which is very good cred, by the way. It looks, that doesn't just look like you're another, uh, you know, I don't know, Paul Wolfowitz type, like you're, you're definitely going for, for, for something that, that at least superficially is different. So we have this elite overproduction. It enables people to basically just have people compete like battle royale style uh, to see who can be whatever is the dominant ideology in, in the, the kind of managerial class, which right now I would describe as as wokeness, it is social justice. It is this um, millennial turn on on culture war. Right, but it, it serves a particular utility in a country that's a target of U.S. empire, whether Cuba or China, where there is some minority group that can be exploited through the rhetoric of social justice. In China, you have the Uyghurs and so much of the rhetoric around the Uyghurs and Chinese authoritarianism reminds me of the rhetoric that I grew up hearing around, the, you know, when we learned about the, the civil rights movement or even in, in BLM. And then BLM style rhetoric was transit, transferred onto Cuba, which is a socialist leftist country when it had its recent SOS Cuba protests. And the black population, the Afro-Cuban population, which is which has borne the most extreme brunt of the U.S. embargo, and which is uh, more detached from the kind of patriotic revolutionary experience of many Cubans than than the average Cuban on a dispro like a disproportionate level. They were presented as sort of the the set piece for the U.S. regime change color revolution style operation in Cuba, where Cuba's government run by a light skinned president, Miguel Diaz Canel, was actually racist against the Afro-Cuban population yeah. when what they experience, any racism they experience is so much less uh, historically painful and um, structural than what black Americans actually experience. So, I mean, I think there's a utility to this kind of language beyond just sheer marketing in splitting countries that have their own racial and cultural divisions. Absolutely. I mean, you don't even have to change it that much to apply it to the Western Hemisphere because all Western Hemisphere countries, yes, including Canada, if to a lesser degree, have this very strong racial dynamic that comes from European colonialism. So um, it, it kind of is like almost like custom built to operate in the Western Hemisphere, as we saw with the ridiculous farce of Janine Añez, who would be considered by rational people to be a Christian fascist, uh, described yeah. as a woman's activist in many Western <laughs> reports. So um, it, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting dynamic, but it also does apply in these weird kind of um, modulated, uh, partially uh, rearranged versions elsewhere. I would say a really good example of this is um, actually a lot of the media coverage of, of various Kurdish militias in the Middle East. Right, um, right. And that one, that one was really quite popular with people on like the far left too. And you had these kind of obvious photo ops of these like Kurdish militia people with like rainbow flags, like posed in like these bombed out cities. And uh, it was just so obvious to me that there was an attempt to manufacture consent around the populace to get more involved in in these in these countries and in an often military capacity. I got uh, the Janine Anya's Forbes Bolivia cover on right now. <laughs> El poder de femenino, de femenino, <laughs> the power of feminism, and she's looking up to the future. She's sort of a like Hillary Clinton, nineteen ninety four, minus the headband. 
Yeah, so, um, so maybe she could fake a southern accent too and uh, really complete the, uh, the time Well, analogy. she certainly could not fake a uh, Aymara accent, and she has now been sentenced to 10 years in prison. So she's now in the clink after presiding over one of the worst massacres of indigenous people in Bolivian recent history. So I don't know if that's the power of feminism or of- That's girl bossery right there. <laughs> Literally slay queen. Slay queen, yeah. <laughs> But you were talking about, you know, Rojava and I mean, this is a fascin this is an issue that's always fascinated me. Rojava, Northeastern Syria, it, it, it's the Kurdish area uh, that they declared autonomous, but it's actually in a country, a post-colonial Arab state that is a target of U.S. imperialism in an extreme way. The U.S. military is controlling that one third of Northeast of Syria in the Northeast where most of Syria's oil wealth and wheat is. And they are using, they've used the, those Kurds as their proxies. And at the same time, you know, I learned about this whole phenomenon through, uh, you know, self-described Antifa members in DC who are going over to Rojava to train and fight along with these Kurds um, that they went over there because, well, Sorry, Rojava was the only decentralized or the, the, the most you know powerful example of decentralized feminist power in the world. And yet four U.S. military bases were present in this area. And they were I mean, why not go, go fight with the U.S. Marines directly is what I would ask them. They wouldn't know what to say. I don't personally know enough about the internal dynamics to say how how much how much independence they had or did not have, but I definitely can tell you that there was a very coordinated um, effort on both behalf of cer certain aspects of the media as well as I would say um, probably uh, certain aspects in in the foreign policy establishment to make that fight look as hip and radical as possible, and therefore to at least at the very least disarm. Uh, criticism coming from the left towards the U.S. Syria policy. Right. Totally. I mean, and then along with, uh, oh man, this is great. I mean, all, well, all, all, along with uh, the kind of counterinsurgency campaign that took place within the left where you had Haymarket, for example, which is this um, nonprofit, which serves as the foundation arm for the ISO, a now defunct organization, the International Socialist Organization that to me really carries the legacy of the Congress on Cultural Freedom, supports regime change pretty much everywhere on the basis of revolution from below and attacked relentlessly anyone who opposed US regime change in Syria and arming forces that were regressive, retrograde. They were Al Qaeda. They supported right. putting women under theocratic rule and and killing them if they violated those uh, medieval style Saudi style laws. Um, but you know you'd have these woke people who were self described socialists cheering for them. I mean the the ISO's own journal described Al Nusra as honest working class fighters. Al Nusra being the Syrian arm of Al Qaeda. Yeah, uh, it's it's a bizarro world that is only possible if people just get as they do get bombarded with too much information from different uh, all different sides and then they just kind of defer to things because if you actually pay attention this is the most incoherent stuff imaginable but the same people that are complaining that the taliban took down a george floyd uh poster in kabul uh which by the way why was there a george floyd poster in kabul um are the same ones who often will say we need to intervene on the side of uh, non-state actor X, Y, and Z, who many of whom can be uh, as bad or worse than the Taliban. Uh, and so we have this very interesting, and this I think is, an, I mean, I didn't really get into this into the paper because the paper isn't really about left or right or anything like that. It's, it's really just about a, a process and what's popular right. and who's, who's doing what. But something that I did think about when I was writing the paper is how there has been a lot of pushback on US intervention in Syria from both the right and the left. And, yep. and one of the useful um, aspects of interjecting culture war, be it from either the right or the left into foreign policy, is that you can always say, well, if you are opposed to intervention in country X, then you must be this 
unpopular thing, which right now in media circles would be right wing. So I have no doubt that I will receive criticism from writing, even though it's a nonpartisan and, and, and not very editorial uh, um, uh, uh, white paper. But I have no doubt that I will receive criticism for writing Woke Imperium by saying people just assuming that I'm conservative or right wing, which actually is not true. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is the, the go to point is uh, if you said you shouldn't militarily intervene against Assad, then you must be part of the alt-right or whatever. And I'm like, well, uh, no. <laughs> well, they say that about me as well. Um, I'm, I'm pretty accustomed to it. And they demonstrate their weakness by consistently failing to cancel me. I mean, every few years, there's some like open letter demanding I be blacklisted from whatever organized left circles exist. And it just doesn't seem to go anywhere. Um, I mean, this is a very weak movement, which has found its strength by having its slogans and language co-opted by an empire it claims to oppose. Here's the intercept, uh, which might actually be better referred to as the interventionist from 2017. The real height of the um, pseudo left ca counterinsurgency campaign against leftists and right wing or right wing anti-war elements who opposed intervening in Syria. And it's by a Syrian exile, Syrian American exile, Miriam Elba, who is like the brought in as like a fact checker at the intercept because they have so many positions for PMC type people uh, who basically do nothing and get huge salaries from Pierre Omidyar, who is himself a intelligence cutout. I mean, he's funding so many of these different regime change, color revolution style operations. And it's why white nationalists love Bashar al-Assad based on one video of some alt-right guys at a rally wearing like, you know, those helicopter t-shirts celebrating Pinochet. And they're, they're like right. talking about dropping barrel bombs and how awesome barrel bombs are and saying Assad did nothing wrong. So that becomes a jumping off point for claiming everyone is a racist who doesn't want the U.S. to bomb the crap out of Damascus and have Al Qaeda take over. And before that, I was showing an image, which is just supremely ironic, of George Floyd in Idlib, which is the province in northwestern Syria that is controlled by Al Qaeda's rebranded affiliate Hayat Tahrir al Sham, which is now known as the Salvation Front, and you know is it's still it's still Al Qaeda. They're still with Turkish tutelage implementing some form of theocratic law. And they don't really seem to like black Americans that much. That mural was painted by a some guy funded by a German NGO, like a German billionaire backed NGO. And days after it was photographed, it was vandalized and the face of George Floyd was covered up. So I don't think the locals liked it too much. Um, but this illustrates your point pretty well. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting, and and this actually kind of brings me to to another point I made in the um, paper, which is okay. So the class element is a, a, is actually the same with other fads, the cultural fads that have infiltrated the, the, the establishment before. Uh, that's a continuation. Um, this is a, an attempt to kind of resurrect the Boston Brahmins to have like the old white Anglo-Saxon Protestant like Ivy League elite who all kind of think the same things control everything. But now it's like intersectional. It's the new intersectional elite. It still believes many of the same things, including having the same view of America on the world stage. But it has a culture war inverted aspect to it. It is no longer a force of conservatism, but one of kind of progressivism. Um, but it, it's fulfilling the same thing but these these things are the continuity i do think there is one key difference in the woke imperium uh that is in fact uh makes it a bit different from most of these other examples like the boston brahmins um and, yeah. and even albeit to a lesser degree to some extent the neocons and that is the desire not just to do political um interference in other countries but to clearly do a cultural interference in other countries uh to actually behave quite literally like missionaries and right. um, albeit not necessarily a faith-based missionary, although I would argue that one could say that that's exactly what it is. But um, the the idea is to actually modify other people's cultures. Now, I'm not saying that every single issue that these people adopt for this purpose or of justifying intervening in another country is wrong. Uh, some of them I actually would like agree with. But the thing is, I mean, if you study history, 
uh, rather than just like what makes you feel good and respond to politics, <laughs> it becomes very obvious that it's actually reactionaries that gain the most from kind of neo-colonial attempts because every single idea that those people postulate then becomes a foreign idea. It's, it's you can't have X, Y, and Z in this country because that's something that foreigners want. Therefore, they're agents. You're an agent of a foreign state. And it actually produces a backlash. Whereas the countries that broke free more successfully or avoided colonialism entirely, they tended to adopt programs that were not you know, just reactionary. There's there's actually a really great term for it in a book I recently read about the Meiji Restoration called Cosmopolitan Chauvinism, which says, which is basically the, the tendency of reformist nationalists to say, if you can do something, we can do it too. Maybe we can do it even better. And, and, and this tends to create governments that are in fact not necessarily <laughs> reactionary on all issues that often do consider um, policies that are very reformist towards a variety of groups of people, uh, towards the legal system, but you're less likely to see this. This is this is not this exact example is not used in Woke Imperium, but I am planning a follow-up piece that would very much talk about this issue, uh, how how self-determination actually is better for reform than kind of foreign uh, missionary or interventionism is. And um, it, it really just, I think you can't draw like a one-to-one -one comparison on everything, but it really does seem the overall trend is when people are in charge of their own destiny and when they're not insecure, i.e. they're not facing targeted regime change policies, be it economic or military, they're more likely to, to enact policies which are like taking into account maybe domestic iniquities that they have. Um, but when you as a foreign country come in and meddle with people, and there's no better example of this than the kind of uh, the, the overwhelming majority of like um, anti-gay laws in the third world tend to come from ex-British colonies and they tend right. to be put on the the, the law books by British colonial administrators. So like, this is a thing that needs to be acknowledged regardless of how you feel about things. And then this in turn creates a backlash, which if you're American is bad for you because then foreign countries are just, oh, you're coming here to socially engineer my culture in ways that I don't even understand. Um, why would you do that to me? Like, are, are you all like this? Yeah, we just don't trust you in anything you say, which means that if these policies were dropped by the foreign policy establishment, you'd still have to rebuild trust anyway when you re-engage in diplomacy with some of these countries. So all in all, I think that while the PMC classes that support this ideology are winning in their internal competition, and they're they're very much like, and certain aspects of the media really enjoy it, I think this is a lose-lose situation for everyone. I, I, I think it, it harms many of the causes it claims to uh, care about abroad. Uh, uh, I think it, it, it justifiably um, increases suspicion abroad. And then it also creates this potential backlash that could uh, negatively impact the United States and its diplomatic efforts in the future. So on the whole, I, I do think this particular aspect of it, um, it is incredibly destructive and, yeah. and is, is a problem. Uh, whether you're just critiquing U.S. foreign policy or if you're concerned like me for, for like a constructive uh kind of grand strategy alternative like it's just it's just kind of make gonna make everyone look bad <laughs> well i'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the work of joseph Mossad, who is a palestinian academic at columbia university his or his book desiring arabs but his book really spells out what i think you were saying before and it's a very controversial book. I mean, it's come under heavy attack from uh, some gay rights activists in academia. Um, his thesis, if I'm getting it right, is that men had traditionally had sexual relationships with other men in Arab cultures. Uh, but when Arab cultures were colonized, these men were given an identity and the, that identity was came from the West, the identity of, of, of gayness, the LGBTQ identity. And that identity then made them targets of the wider society because they were seen sort of as colonial agents. Um, and that carries over into Eastern Europe, for example, where you have many foundations set up to promote the open society vision of George Soros, who is also dedicated to regime change, toppling the authoritarians. And now in Poland, he has a 
trans rights initiative, which is inflaming an enormous amount of anger in a highly conservative nationalistic country. It seems to be sort of backfiring on, on trans people um, and on the whole LGBT, what, what, what they would call the LGBT community there. Um, you also see it in Russia as well with all of these laws that are being uh, passed to oppose the what pr promotion of homosexuality to children i, I think those i think laws. yeah i think the, the nature of the laws is actually that like you just can't have any positive media representation of of anything like that like a normalized relationship or anything like that uh, i don't know exactly the details but it it doesn't really help um when certain countries albeit not many yet but i think it might be a growing trend but russia is very much in the lead here certain countries decide to buy into this like american culture war and say aha but we're the other side right like we're we're the resistance to the american culture war and this is kind of part of the everything gets worse that i was mentioning right like this isn't going to help anyone and uh russia doing this is it's it's not like oh brave russia standing up you know for <laughs> um against american wokeness it, i mean it's, it's bolsonaro it's the it's the fidesz party in hungary it's all of these parties as their brand are we're standing up against the american culture war and it's working it's working because people don't want to feel that they're being you know, ideologically colonized by an alien power. I mean, it even worked to a degree in France, Macron of all people, the, the darling of, of the kind of Acela corridor, if you will, to use your term. Um, Macron came out and was like, we're against weird American infiltration of our public policy discussion. We're against this like uh, American progressivism. And of course that's especially ironic because of course so much of this comes from French theory originally. Um, and it's just yeah. being kind of put through this like weird, like puritanical, like Anglo filter and, and then like crap back onto them. And now they're like, oh, what is this alien thing? But you know, I it, he even is doing it, so. And he was a McKinsey executive, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, as everyone in his rough age group who who gets very far ahead uh, does seem to be. <laughs> yeah, Buddha Judge doing a great job at transportation secretary. Extremely successful. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> but that's also like think about like okay, so Pete Buddha Judge isn't in the foreign policy establishment really, but like he, he is very much a creature of 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 political establishment. Think about how he was sold in in the primaries. Um, well, he sold himself. He marketed himself. Yeah, exactly. And it was like, uh, I am the most milquetoast Democrat you could ever find, but I'm gay. And <laughs> the funny thing is how this didn't even work with like U.S. gays. Like he was like ranked, I think, third in, in the candidates of uh, for like LGBT people, um, uh, their preferences for the candidates. So I, I just don't like there's only so much that this can get you but it does well, he's I not only the, a milk toast democrat he's not only like a centrist boring democrat he's the most boring gay man ever ever yeah <laughs> no, no, <laughs> unrelatable on every level kamala harris too i mean she was rejected by black americans her approval rating was very low during the primary um, yeah and, and i think you see like this is a utility in the sense it's, now take candidates and replace them with policies and it's like oh i see now you're going to sell me the most boring policy that we've ever had the same thing that we've ever had the thing we technically don't like but you're going to dress it up in this you know with a blm sticker and a rainbow flag and it's going to be oh right okay uh but you know and this isn't like some yeah i think there's a lot of reasons to be opposed to this and it's not just because one might be like conservative or whatever i mean i myself am not i myself am gay like it's not like a um it's just like it comes across it's a curse in a way right like it's it's almost like how some countries regret like the resource curse it's almost like oh if it's a it's a curse to be like considered something that is in when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> like the bipartisan establishment wanting to sell, you know, the same old package with the new with the new uh, rapper, and and it's a curse to be like kind of if in any way, no matter how indirect, kind of connected to this stuff, uh, right? Being like, oh well, you should support this because you believe X, Y, and Z, and it's like, but I don't like I, not at all. I I think that coming of age in the Bush administration, if anything, taught me to be incredibly 
uh, skeptical and dismissive of anyone who claims to know my best interest based off of a kind of universalist ideology. And, and I think that that goes double for uh, foreign policy because you're taking something that is specifically context dependent in both time and space, and you're saying we can apply this to the entire world. And, right. um, and that's a huge problem. I, I, I mean, that could just Biden, just like Trump before him, just like Obama before him, are all each one of their administrations. I actually for IPD did a, a sanctions report about over a year ago, tracking how sanctions just go up and up and up every year, every administration, regardless of party, regardless of candidate. And um, they just keep going up. And they're not effective. Like for overwhelmingly, they're ineffective. Sometimes they actually produce counterproductive results. Uh, we right. might be seeing some of that in Russia right now. And so, like, I think this is kind of more the future of the woke imperium. I mean, I'm not ruling out the military interventionist side. Obviously, as a member of the realism and restraint community, that's always like we're trying to stop these like needless like luxury wars, if you will. But but I do think that people recognize in a lot of the establishment that that is very unpopular and that they're not it's harder to gin up support for it so i think we're moving to an economic direction even though as my prior research has shown it has failed miserably like <laughs> the u.s sanctions for policy is really actually doing a lot of damage to u.s uh, standing abroad particularly kind of on the economic side of diplomacy with like trade deals and whatnot and strong arming allies into following these these things and it's it's doing economic damage to the world, but it's not completing any of its objectives. Nevertheless, for people that are very socially progressive and very sanctimonious and believe that it's our job to like, you know, spread ourselves, our, our new found sense of historical guilt or whatever across the world, it is very obviously like sanctions might be their preferred method to do it. And so regardless of what the actual feedback on if sanctions are effective or not, it's going to be like, well, we can always sanction them. And I think that's kind of how it starts. I think that's how you're going to see a lot of this moving into the future. Well, they use the, they justify the sanctions on the basis of this Manichaean worldview that you shred in your piece of authoritarianism versus democracy or freedom. Authoritarian access. Gotta love the use of access in that phrase, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a John Bolton phrase that's now been filtered into the Democratic Party through people like Madeleine Albright, whose last work on fascism basically declared fascism to be any country in the world that the U.S. wanted to overthrow. And the U.S. is just purely democratic. Um, that's incredibly dangerous. It's a messianic point of view that essentially rules out diplomacy with any of these countries. And that's why we see this constant escalation with Russia. But I think that's the point. The point is just constant escalation and justifying institutions that have outlived their usefulness like NATO. Well, I um, think that's that's somewhat more debatable whether NATO has a purpose or not. But I definitely think that NATO is, my opinion on that, I'm very ambivalent on, on the alliance, but, but um, I definitely think you're seeing NATO self-justify in these terms. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, There's it's growing. Like NATO conferences and... on on women's rights. You know, NATO's conferences on on you know uh, making the workplace like friendly for everyone. And I'm like, what does this have to do with a military alliance? <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's a reaffirming the bonds of of the North Atlantic, I guess. Well, I mean, look at look at this. I mean, you have the perfect person. She's like the the Scandinavian AOC, Sana Marine the feminist prime minister leading a coalition of women. And, you know, she wears like these power blazers and is just beloved by social Democrats, but she is le helping lead the world to world war three. She is leading Finland without a referendum, without a plebiscite into NATO. And that um, I think speaks to the, your paper very well. And also I wanted to, I mean, since also we're talking about German institutions that are, I don't know if you paid attention to that, but the German Green Party is a really interesting example. Of oh, well, Baerbach, exactly. As a whole. Yeah, they have a whole bunch of these people. It's very weird. Well, another struggling institution is the Pentagon. I mean, we've seen the Pentagon uh, just, just to lower its uh, recruitment standards so that it will now allow people who did not graduate from high school to join the military. And it's struggling to recruit. If you look at any of the 
Pentagon recruitment ads that show up during NFL games, for example, the major ads, they feature parents and the parents are skeptical about their kids joining and the kids stand up for themselves and basically defy the parents and say, I want to do this because I want to be a hacker and I want to fight for freedom. But you have another ad that's kind of playing off a more well-known CIA ad that I want to show here that I think speaks to the value of the woke Imperium at a time of institutional crisis and public uh, collapse of public trust in the military, mainly because parents don't want their kids to get their legs blown off in a conflict that is meaningless. Like I would Afghanistan. Think that would be the number one yeah. reason. Yeah. This is the story of a soldier who operates your nation's Patriot missile defense systems. It begins in California with a little girl raised by two moms. Although I had a fairly typical childhood, took ballet, played violin, I also marched for equality. I like to think I've been defending freedom from an early age. When I was six years old, one of my moms had an accident that left her paralyzed. Doctors said she might never walk again, but she tapped into my family's pride to get back on her feet. Eventually standing at the altar to marry my other mom, with such powerful role models, I finished high school at the top of my class and then attended UC Davis, where I joined a sorority full of other strong women. But as graduation approached, I began feeling like I'd been handed so much in life, a sorority girl stereotype. Sure, I'd spent my life around inspiring women, but what had I really achieved on my own? One of my sorority sisters was studying abroad in Italy Another was climbing Mount Everest. I needed my own adventures, my own challenge. And after meeting with an army recruiter, I found it, a way to prove my inner strength and maybe shatter some stereotypes along the way. I'm US Army Corporal Emma Malone Lord, and I answered my calling. <sighs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> So you got you got the two moms. You have the uh, f standing up for freedom. And that's the first time I've seen that one, by the way. So uh, thanks for that. <laughs> you haven't seen that before? No, that's new for me. <laughs> so demonstrating for equality, and then going to college. So someone who's clearly educated, and then the army becomes kind of an individual experience of self actualization rather than actually yeah. being part of a a corporatized. A unit that specializes in mass killing and ex ex eliminating the enemy and advancing American power. It's about becoming a strong woman. Um, and, you know, none of these, those things are, there's anything wrong with any of them on their own, but it's very clear that the Pentagon through its massive public relations wing found this person and decided to make them a poster child of their recruiting efforts. Yeah, I mean, just think of how, like, I know that the the first reaction that people would have to something like that is like, look how far we've come. And on some level, that's true. Like, you know, when I became an adult, uh, don't ask, don't tell was the law. Um, and you could be, you know, fired from the military, even if, you know, if you were just found out to be gay, not not even, you know, if, if you were like wearing it loud and proud. So yeah, sure. I, I would say that's a positive change, but like this is used in the same way that like stuff back then was used in the other direction. It's like, you know, that old, that old like pre-Iraq war, there was this military recruitment ad where there's like a lava monster and like the, there's like a guy who like climbs a mountain and he like picks up a sword and he like slays the lava monster. Right. <laughs> and like that kind of stuff was like in then and like now it's this kind of stuff. And I'm like, but it's, it's still, it's doing the same thing. It's like, don't you want to be, at the cutting edge of what's really cool. Like this is cool. Right. Um, and, and I think the, that the, the initial, the, the, the old ads were, you know, appealing to young men who would 
you know, sl wanted to slay monsters and emulate the video games that they'd been relegated to playing. There really weren't any monsters to slay in their real lives. Then we, I mean, the most, the most notorious of these kind of woke marketing ads, which you have definitely seen is the humans of CIA. Oh, and yeah. I think this one serves a slightly different purpose because I'm not sure the CIA is having recruitment problems, but we can talk about that. And um, we did a parody of this at the gray zone, which I'll play at the end, but I think it's important to revisit this because this is the most aggressive expression of woke Imperium, I think ever. When I was 17, I quoted Zora Neale Hurston's How It Feels to Be Colored Me in my college application essay. The line that spoke to me stated simply, I am not tragically colored. There is no sorrow dammed up in my soul nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. At 17, I had no idea what life would bring, but Sora's sentiment articulated so beautifully how I felt as a daughter of immigrants. And she's speaking kind of like in slam Nothing poetry style. Or is tried. Mm -hmm. I am perfectly made. I can wax eloquent on complex legal issues. Maybe she could give the uh, Harris inauguration. Guayaquil de mis amores in Spanish. I can change a diaper with one hand and console a crying toddler with the other. I am a woman of color. I am a mom. I am a cisgender millennial who's been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. Oh I'm man. But my, my existence, existence is not a box checking exercise. I am a walking declaration. A woman who's in flesh. You just checked a bunch of boxes. End of her sentences, That's suggesting what it's about on so here she's walking I by all the white men and CIA. she's my there's Brennan. Was not and is not the result of a fluke or slip through the cracks. I earned my way in and I earned my way up the ranks of this organization. I am educated, qualified, and competent. And sometimes I struggle. I struggle feeling like I could do more, be more to my two sons. And I imposter syndrome. That's what AOC so talks about a lot. I used to struggle with imposter syndrome, but at 36, oh, well, there it is. I refuse to internalize misguided patriarchal ideas of what a woman can or should be. I am tired of feeling like I'm supposed to apologize for the space I occupy rather than intoxicate people with my effort, my brilliance. Yeah, you should apologize I for I am proud time. of me, full stop. My parents left everything they knew and loved to expose me to opportunities they never had. Because of them, I stand here today a proud first-generation Latina and officer at CIA. I am unapologetically me. I want you to be unapologetically you, whoever you are. Know your worth. Command your space. Especially if you live in Venezuela. Then you really, really better be unapologetically you. Yeah, if you can afford to eat when your country is completely blockaded. I mean, the CIA has been responsible for some of the most heinous crimes visited on the on the American continent, but particularly in Latin America. Um, I mean, the rape of nuns in El Salvador, the mining of the Nicaraguan Harbor, the entire dirty wars in those Central American countries, the extermination of Mayans in Guatemala through the dictator Efrain Rios Montt, the blockade of Venezuela, which was costing hundreds of thousands of lives each year by just starving its economy. The, what we we spoke about Bolivia. I mean, we could go on and on. The Operation Condor in the 1970s. So this ad is essentially addressing all of that without addressing it by papering it over and presenting the CIA as a woke institution that welcomes a Latina or Latin X individual who um, has a disability and is a single mother from the who is a child of. Of, of immigrants, that's that's one way I see this. But what what are your impressions of this ad, and why did it, why was it necessary for the CIA to publish it? Well, I I, I actually have a, a link to that in one of the footnotes of of the <laughs> of the Woke Imperium because it it was a, a striking example of this. I, I think in a way, um, I mean, yeah, it, it's doing what all of this that I've already mentioned is doing, but I think it's doing something else too. It's, it's explicitly kind of making an argument that um, hit 
history is like bad. The past was bad. And like we did bad things in the past. We're not denying that. Like look at all these, you know, like old white men in, 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 in that I'm walking by in the hallway, right? But things are different now. And on some level, I think this is one of the more unique aspects of the Loke Imperium is that it it does break with the past. It, it, it says, or it says it breaks with the past in the sense that like, we're having a reckoning and this reckoning makes us not only different from other countries but different from our own country as it was before and now things are going to be totally different now the, the focus and i think very implicitly it's implied there the focus of the cia is like lifting people up you know ascend rise up uh, whatever um and, and you know maybe well they're intelligent they're in the intelligence community it's a community of intelligent people that's yeah, <laughs> and they helped stop Donald Trump. I mean, you saw John Brennan in that ad. He was sort of her patron, and this is a John Brennan and inclusion initiative. And Brennan was leading the. He he was one of the key figures designing the whole Russia Gate operation. Yeah, um, it's it's. I mean, Russia Gate did not stop Donald Trump, so. <laughs> no. uh, but many, many other CIA projects have not met with success either, as we know. Um, but it, it's it's interesting. It, it, to me, it's just interesting to see that when I look at that, I think it's really easy and almost maybe psychologically reassuring to see stuff like that and say, this is all cynical calculation. All of this is fake. Um, to someone like me, who's like... <laughs> <laughs> or like a really cynical realist, it's the opposite. To me, the idea that any of these people could genuinely believe this is so much more horrifying than the idea that it's all fake. And I, I think that some of these people do genuinely believe this. I'm not saying all of them do. I, I would be willing to guess that the higher up you go in rank, probably the proportions get a bit more on the cynical side. But this is something I learned when I worked in DC. I actually, I, and this is not like, me being bitter or anything because i actually had a pretty good time <laughs> overall but like something i noticed was how many people in dc in the professional like class there do actually believe a lot of the american exceptionalist rhetoric do actually believe a lot of the political stuff and therefore i do think we have to extend the benefit of the doubt that many people do believe the woke stuff as well and i think oh that definitely and, and I, I would be willing to bet that that woman in that ad is at least being partially, you know, honest there. And when I look at stuff like that, that actually fills me with a lot of concern because it's much harder to go to someone and like present a balance sheet of like cost versus benefits um, and convince them when they have like a true kind of universal belief. Um, if, if they're someone who, who just wants to kind of maximize like, uh, policy deliverables, I actually think it's much easier to persuade them to change policy. Um, but when you see something like that, my fear would be like people that genuinely believe this one day are holding immensely powerful positions on the diplomatic uh, stage and therefore are unwilling to maybe rethink certain um, alliance networks or to rethink certain policies or to reappraise sanctions because no, they're not just upholding the national interest, they're doing the right thing. They, they are quote unquote on the right side of history. And, and well, that well, to it's, me is the scary It's part. more frightening than that, Chris, I think, because they actually not only see themselves as on the right side of the hit of history, like the old neocons did, they see themselves as defending oppressed people or fighting oppression, including their own oppression. Now consider the figure of the enemy during the war on terror. It was what they would call in academic circles, the subaltern. It was an olive skinned Arab male, generally often from a poor background. It often was a Palestinian, the most dispossessed, some of the most abused people on earth who've been walking through this, suffering through this 70 year cavalry at the, at the hands of a nuclear armed apartheid state. And now consider the figure of the enemy. It's Vladimir Putin riding shirtless on a horse, the cisgendered heteronormative patriarchal male who's presented as anti-gay and even as a white nationalist and uh, in, 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 which is, which is absurd. I can see some of the other critiques. Um, so the opposition to Putin or Russia then becomes irrational in the mindset of a progressive person or a person who identifies as a member 
of a oppressed group who goes into the national security bureaucracy. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And also, I, I think you also, as part of this universal narrative, the other dangerous thing is, is it's these issues, many of which are real in these other countries, are presented through this uniquely American lens. Because, of course, to understand these issues, one has to be like performatively knowledgeable, but they're not willing to oftentimes like be really knowledgeable about other societies. So, so the assumption is that like the American uh, version of this applies everywhere. And I think nowhere is this more true than in issues of how uh, race is talked about. Like Vladimir Putin is, is a white nationalist. Like Vladimir Putin's a lot of things, a lot of things I don't like, but white nationalists applying that term even to Russia is so bizarre. Like yeah. you're literally taking like, and Russia has like anyone who's ever, you know, you know, known people like had dealings. Like everyone knows that Russia and a lot of Slavic countries have, have racial, uh, kind of racist attitudes towards a lot of things, but it is nowhere near, um, it, it's nowhere like comparable to how it works in the Americas because it's a totally different dynamic. Like, yeah, there's plenty of racism in Russia. It doesn't behave in the same way. Like, so you can't just, um, and, and the hierarchy isn't the same. And like, it, it, so the sloppy attempt, even through just critiquing other countries, they universalize everything and make it seem like we're all part of this narrative. And, and of course, there's an implicit danger in there too, which is that the American domestic political experiment, which is always unfolding um, throughout history, is actually an international one. And in and, and this, and therefore, like, it, it's everywhere. And everywhere is an American culture war in a way, uh, which has weird feedbacks in both directions, domestic and international. So, like, the, I think on some level they have forgotten that the U.S. is a country, and and they just take uh, the assumption that the U.S. is the world. But these are the last people that would ever admit that, because of course they're very cosmopolitan, and don't you know they're well traveled? They fly between London, Paris, and New York all the time. Um, yeah. <laughs> so they've been everywhere. Um, they, they just, but there is this implicit assumption that all of our fights are the same. That we can critique, use domestic terms to critique of a, another country's foreign policy when, in fact, you should be just critiquing that country's policy on its own, right? Regardless of what you think about it. And it, it's just bizarre because anything to avoid, I think, the number one defense for if you really want to critique a country attacking another country, the number one word that you should learn is sovereignty. And of course, a lot of these people don't want to use that word because the whole point of a lot of this is to downplay sovereignty uh, because we don't oftentimes like it ourselves. <laughs> so they'll never say sovereignty. They'll never use that word. So they have to Except use- Except with Ukraine. Words. Yeah, yeah. They, they have to be like, oh, well, don't you know these people are just so toxic masculinity or something. And, and I mean, there was someone, I don't know who it was, but someone had a sort of really, really awful take on the fact that like Mearsheimer became viral and said like, when I hear Mearsheimer, like it reminds me of sexual assault. And I'm like, who, what kind of commentary <laughs> is this? But it was, it was like some like, you know, uh, liberal internationalist like um, person. Yeah, I, I don't remember. Not like famous person, so I don't remember. But they were, they were like, this this is like this is like sexual assault when you hear Mearsheimer talk about um, you know great power politics. So I, I I just don't even know how to respond to this aside from to dismiss it because it's it's unhinged really. Well, it's kind I, of very I, right. But that's the point, I guess. Make it hard to critique the people that wield it. Yeah, I mean, and I, I was thinking about this piece, decolon, which you mentioned in your paper decolonize russia it uses the whole you know <laughs> radical left language of decolonize this is someone casey michelle who's far from a leftist basically spook adjacent washington dc hudson institute neocon type character who is obsessed with trying to prove that the gray zone is a, a kremlin influence operation um and yeah, he's using this language of colonialism, but you know, he would never use it to describe anything the U.S. has done vis-a-vis -vis Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Syria. Yeah, well, it's it's always going to be selective. That's that's the thing. This is the problem. When you play around with these like universalist narratives, you're all inevitably going to be a hypocrite because everyone, when you're talking about issues of alliance and intervention, everyone there is no universal standard. Everyone does, um, you know, certain. We can talk about human rights in other countries all day long, but we're not going to talk about human rights in Saudi Arabia. So <laughs> it's it's a very it's a very interesting dynamic they get to, and I honestly, I think the contortions that people have to make to justify their positions end up making 
their positions even more weird uh, on some level because they're like, oh, yes, but here's the exception that I'm really reaching for. And it, it's just like a new cause du jour that they attach to like why we should sanction some country that's dependent on food imports or something. It, it's, right. it's very, very weird. Um, and, and I do think, like I said, that there is genuine belief here, which I do find disturbing. But but as I also said before, it is it is also the, the term, the hard policy outcome is still um, kind of a, a continuation. And, and there's a specific reason that in the conclusion of the paper, even though it's more of an analysis piece and, and less of a like this is like this. Um, I, I make a very specific uh, um, comparison that I knew I had to make since before I even started writing it. And that was that um, something that people should always keep in mind is that in the 19th century, in the from the 18th through 19th century, the British Empire um, began creating, uh, expanding the institution of transatlantic slavery everywhere it could go. Uh, the British Empire did did a lot to spread chattel slavery around the world. Not that it didn't exist in various places, but did a lot to really expand the amount of chattel slavery there was in the world to conquer land that was good for plantations that could be used by chattel slaves. Fast forward a couple generations. British Empire gets credit for being the first major power to outlaw the slave trade. British Empire then goes continuing to expand, particularly deep into Africa, under the justification that the British Empire is an abolitionist empire whose goal is to exterminate slavery from the world. So phase one was expand slavery to make money and conquer more land. Phase two was conquer more land under the justification of exterminating slavery. Both served the purpose of expanding the British Empire, and I would say expanding it way beyond even the means where it was actually making a buck anymore, and it became almost burdensome on some level, but um, it was always to expand. And I have no doubt, because of the large time gaps between those events, that there were people in the first phase that were like, yeah, let's go, we want more plantations, who genuinely felt that. And there were also people who, uh, later on, who were like genuine abolitionists. But right. it served the same purpose of unsustainable expansion. It served the purpose to always have a justification to intervene um, in other countries' affairs. And I think that that example is particularly pertinent when we're looking at a country uh, effectively pivoting from like raw, raw, Toby Keith, trucker nuts uh, militarization into like um, toothpaste colored hair and uh, like uh, being uh, feeling unsafe uh, uh, on campus as <laughs> as its next thing because it is in the end the people might be different and 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 the culture behind it, it has to be reckoned with in a different way but it 100 is meant to uphold the same process and that is a process of militarized expansionism on the world stage which i mean as we saw in afghanistan did not benefit women did not act, i mean maybe a certain class of women in kabul but women in smaller villages did not benefit from the u.s military presence it often Do doesn't it, it often creates a backlash because people say like i said this is this is a foreign attempt to change our culture we have to become more conservative <laughs> in, in order to fight back otherwise you're selling out to the foreigner and either way they got the taliban be, they came back yeah the, uh, what, what did biden just uh downgrade or 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 or, or delist uh, Afghanistan as a uh, non-NATO partner state. The US is sanctioning Afghanistan. I mean it's you know 2001 the US was coming in and along with Revlon to give a Afghan women a, a makeup I think there was a or, or, I forget which makeup company it was. They set up a salon in Kabul and the US was determined to civilize the Afghan people. Now the U S is sanctioning them back to the stone age. So it really shows when a people rejects this, this kind of project, then the U S really rejects and dooms them as well. Same with Syria, Libya. I mean, all the, all the, well, Syria, particularly the failed regime change projects really get the short end of the stick. Um, and I think another and they, and they make U.S. rivals look way more like mature and like less threatening, yeah. which is kind of funny because the intention of all of this, of course, is if we're not there, someone else will be there. And it's like a complete zero sum game. But actually, most of these interventions, I would argue, have actually strengthened uh, America's competitors, which uh, is, you know, 
not their intention, obviously. <laughs> well, there's also the the hypocrisy of it, which strengthens those targeted by the U.S. The, the the two major American rivals in the great power competition, Russia and China. And during Russia Gate, we heard so much about how RT is trying to divide America and sow chaos by simply covering Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Um, you know, my my wife was an RT America correspondent. She was uh, someone who supported the uh, these uh, demonstrations as a kind of new civil rights movement. She just you know was a common American. She was a a woman from a middle class American background who hated police brutality uh, like so many Americans, and so she made the choice to go out and cover the demonstrations against the killing of Philando Castile in Minneapolis or the the brutal killing of Freddie Gray in Baltimore by the Baltimore police. And, but, you know, this was framed by the national security state and its media lackeys as some kind of Russian influence operation to divide America because the U S press was supposed to not cover this somehow, or sort su of su supposed to paper over America's racial crisis, the racial nightmare, the oppression that black people felt felt at the hands of hyper militarized cops. And, you know, you can I, I, I could read it as just the fear among the national within the national security state of American exceptionalism and the being exposed and unmasked on the world stage. And now you have the Chinese diplomats who get called wolf warrior diplomats. If you follow any of their Twitter accounts, I mean, they are focusing on this heavily and sharing memes that um, are sharing memes about the shooting of a black man in Toledo 60 times. Um, anytime there's a high profile killing, they, they will point this out. And why are they pointing it out? It's because the U.S. tried to do that to them with the Uyghurs and they basically got sick of it. And so they're going to point the finger back. So even if RT was being totally cynical and programming the brains of its uh, largely progressive or libertarian staffers, uh, it was pointing the finger back at the U.S. for what the U.S. was doing to them. And the U.S., frankly, in my opinion, they deserve it. It deserves it after what it's tried to do, because it's not only highlighting race, uh, you know, ethnic oppression in countries that it's targeting. It's actually often arming those ethnic groups, training them and encouraging them to commit acts of terror, as we've seen with the um, East Turkestan Islamic movement in uh, Western China. Well, if you play the game of universal moralism, then you will lose. And other countries were not interested in playing this game. And the US and the UK, I think, and sometimes special guests, uh, you know, non-entities like Sweden, um, will, will show up and, and they'll do this. And it's just, it's just a lose-lose situation because other people haven't had multi-generations of being astride the world like a colossus of padding. And they know right. that all of these things are situational and everyone's relationships are contractual. And that is the truth. That's still the, that was always the truth for the U S but there's been enough people that have been kind of uh, protected by it um, that they just don't know that. And they think that it's a canvas for them to paint their, their various ideological projects on. And I would say that it is not that, but if you do it, then you're going to have your rivals do it back to you because no country can do this with and not get pointed out for its own problems. And uh, you just start a whole new thing where that poisons diplomacy, but doesn't actually accomplish anything in the long run. And now the cat's out of the bag and everyone's going to do it back to the U S and the U S was the primary exporter of this. So, you know, what goes around comes around, I guess uh, it, it's, it's just, to me, it just adds a bunch of noise and doesn't add anything to substance. Um, my concern is really more just, that there are more people in the U.S. than in other countries that that might actually believe some of this and say, well, you know, it's our job to constantly uh, bring up how problematic my least favorite non-word yeah. other nations are. And I'm like, well, if you do that, yeah, they're just going to do it back to you. I'm sorry. Like, maybe just don't do it at all. <laughs> but <laughs> Whatever. 
that's like the job of every foreign policy writer at the Washington Post or you know, for, uh, foreign policy, the kind of center left centrist foreign policy writers is to problematize other countries where the, that the US is sanctioning and to f just zoom in as much as possible on their cultural and political flaws until they become utterly unrelatable and demonic. And, and, and another these, these people will, will acknowledge our flaws too, but not as in real time, right? Yeah, like other, yeah. other countries' flaws are like an emergency. We must do something now. Like we must do something. Trademark symbol is like the perfect call of all of this, right? But when it comes to our issues, it's like, well, that's complicated. We have to have a discussion. But then we do, and then we say, okay, that was bad, but now we're moving on. And it's like, okay. I get it, but maybe the level of nuance would be nice to see in when you look at yeah, <laughs> well, we are we we have to live up to our creed. See, we have an original creed. We have a dream. It's that like, and then Cory Booker says, "We rise together." It's the the liberal ethos always sees America constantly moving forward, leaning forward, as MSNBC said. Obama, we it was oh, that the was their logo for a while, wasn't it? I yeah, no, it, it was that. the Obama era slogan of MSNBC <laughs> is that we're leaning forward and that we've we're overcoming our original sin, which was slavery and the oppression of black people with the o Obama in the White House, whereas other countries are they don't have that creed. And therefore, when there's an, a humanitarian emergency, we have to go in and just basically uh, sodomize the, their leader with a bayonet as we saw with Gaddafi, and then reduce the country to a destabilized moonscape overrun by slave auctions and uh, various w competing warlords. That really, to me, is, is the liberal mentality in it. I mean, crudely distilled when it comes to the U.S. versus the rest of the world, oppression in the U.S. versus the rest of the world. And uh, I think ahead. there's multiple kinds of liberals, but you're, I mean, I think that when it comes particularly to the IR theory of liberalism, there absolutely, there's something to that. There, the IR like, shit lib. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the, it's the idea of like, um, yeah, we have, we're a country with a mission and other countries don't have a mission and, and that's always what the thing is. And, and the mission in the past was different. Now the mission is wokeness. I don't think it will always be that way, by the way. I mean, as you mentioned before, wokeness isn't exactly the most popular ideology even at home. Uh, it's certainly not very popular abroad. And eventually, after a few uh, setbacks, they're going to realize, oops, like this really isn't helping us. Um, and they're going to have to change it. You know, it's going to have to change and it will change again. It will change again. Absolutely. Well, I actually Maybe saw even Trump a reaction to wokeness. I saw Trump answering at least a populist call for a course correction in his 2016 campaign. And when he made statements that were completely at odds with the with American exceptionalism, like Saddam Hussein, yeah, he was a killer, but 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 we have killers too. We've been killers too. Yeah, we're all killers. We're <laughs> all killers. It just spread so much outrage in liberal foreign policy circles in the Beltway press. I mean, the idea that someone would say something that was just so obviously true in opposition to one of the most disastrous foreign policy decisions of a generation uh, really told me that once Trump is gone, this kind of uh, humanitarian interventionist thinking is going to come back with a vengeance. And here we have it with Ukraine. Um, and there's the perfect leader there, Zelensky, sort of an actor. I bet there's film. already a Funko pop of him. Uh, but one thing that, that I, I, before Russia invaded Ukraine, I actually thought that the first deployment of the woke Imperium post Arab spring, like the proper woke Imperium, I actually thought the way the media was covering things, that it was going to be in Ethiopia. Um, I thought that's what, and I think that maybe they were thinking that, but now there's something bigger, there's something more covered, there's something that's perhaps more geopolitically relevant on a, on a scale. So it, it, we're seeing some of it in, in, in you, the Ukraine coverage. Um, but um, I do think that 
should, in the unlikely event that there's like a diplomatic solution soon, I think that uh, it's quite possible you could see it pivot back to the current inter-ethnic strife in Ethiopia, because I think there was a, a move to kind of push in that direction. I definitely yeah. think in the long run, you will see it deployed against Venezuela, for sure. Um, perhaps more, more strongly there than anywhere else. Um, yeah, who, it, it, it's it's meant to appeal to certain causes and certain people, and and I think that it's meant to demonize a country so to make it easier to intervene against them in some way, economically or militarily. And so you're you're going to see more of this, but I do think it's quite possible that you'll see something else <laughs> later, uh, and 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 that thing could be just as bad, maybe worse. Uh, but but it's a it's a process. It will always be moving onward. Um, as long as there is this consensus among many people in the bipartisan elite that there should always be a, a militarized or expansionist solution to U.S. foreign policy issues. Yeah, one other point I wanted you to address that you mentioned in your piece was how the neocons have, including neocons who have aligned themselves with right-wing Republicans traditionally, who have been anti-gay, specifically Bill Kristol, the man responsible for recruiting Sarah Palin, the darling of the Christian right, as John McCain's VP, has have been resurrected and rebranded as woke. You know, Max Max Boot is another character, Iraq yeah. War neocons. I mean, he may not necessarily be a neocon; he's more just a straight militarist. But he's adopted a lot of woke messaging to bring himself into the elite of the Democratic Party. Um, but one of the most disgusting displays of the past few years was on MSNBC, where they lean forward on the show of Ari Melber, who used to be my colleague at The Nation. Um, I never exactly knew what he did there, but he's found his way into MSNBC. And it's, uh, you know, Bill Crystal appearing with the rapper Fat Joe as woke Bill Crystal. Maybe we didn't know Bill like that, but this was the year that many people began referring to woke bill crystal a tribute to the idea that people do evolve and trumpism like a lot of challenges can create strange bedfellows and we learned this isn't just for political junkies fat joe told me his fans now approach him to ask about bill crystal and they clearly clicked when we had them back on the show together and joe taught woke bill about what it means to be lit to be lit. Oh uh, man, I'm happy to be back with Bill. I feel like we made history the first time. <laughs> it was huge. It was it was a moment, you know. We, we say that you was lit. We call it lit. L -I, -T. I, I appreciate that. I'm just lit when I'm very occasionally when I'm on with someone like you. <laughs> so I got my brother here, the dynamic duo. <laughs> yeah. Twitter loves us, man. They love us. <laughs> and none of, of, of this is actually funny, funny or exactly charming. Like his, his, I have no doubt that Twitter loves that. By the way. Oh, when you introduced us, he said, why are you the great fat Joe? Just the Trump show. You know, either you with him or you, you're you not down. I agree, actually. I mean, look, it is. I mean, a very divided country. Speaking you know, truth to power. You bring this face on the air. <laughs> ratings goes up. Yeah, they're really bringing people together. I mean, uh, I don't know how the hell they got together or what Ari Melber was thinking, but... Bill Crystal never actually atoned for any of his past sins there to be anointed as woke. He never d said, you know, we were wrong at the Weekly Standard to denounce gay people or. Uh, and know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't admit action. that now, I don't think, if he was pressed on it. Not that many people he would interact with in the press would press him on it. I mean, you would, to me, I would require him to, you know, and go to Iraq and anoint the wounds of every person injured in that war before he could ever come back and speak in public again. But Ari Melber from The Nation, a magazine that opposed that war stridently, and he's he's budding budding around with him. And I don't know. I, I, they must have paid Fat Joe or something. I mean, he's just some washed up rapper. I don't even know. Fat, Fat Joe was long past peak fame. So yeah. The yeah. But, we're, but, but, we're looking at we're, yeah we're looking at like the I don't know like the his 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 terminal kind of stage of of trying to get relevance back but um but I mean we're yeah. looking at we're looking at different elements here I mean we your your piece really focuses on the millennial and professional managerial class I guess you could also include Gen Xers in there 
but they're in, they're distinct from the neocons. The neocons may have originally come out of the Democratic Party through Scoop Jackson in the 70s, but they ultimately found their way into the Republican Party through Bill Kristol's father, Irving Kristol, and his alliance of convenience with the Christian right and the Ronald Reagan Pentagon. So right. what's going on here? And where do the neocons, the original neocons like Bill Kristol, where do they, they fit into the woke imperium of of the Biden administration and beyond. Well, I mean, and you could argue that they're coming home since they did originate with the Democratic Party. Um, and, and then they will, I think what you're really seeing here, honestly, is that um, culture war's use in upholding the establishment because culture war can always be used to justify any political realignment that someone might want. So I know so many people uh, no, of so many people, I should say. Most of my friends are smarter than this, but I know so many people who hated Bill Kristol in the Bush days, hated him. He was like one of the most arch enemies. Same with Dick Cheney, by the way, all of the Cheneys, really. And now some of those people, they sing the praises of the Cheneys and they sing the praises of Bill Kristol. And I think it's a bit reductive to say it's like, Trump derangement syndrome, orange man bad. I mean, like, I personally am no fan of Trump. So, like, I could get why he could be deeply bothering to someone. But I think it's it's not just that. Like, it, it shows that they're mostly interested on their kind of cultural tribe and not on, say, the economic or foreign policy, hard policy that is a big part of, like, the undergirding a political establishment in many fields. So as long as someone sounds the right notes, they can be manipulated. Oh, it's it, you used to hate Bill Crystal, Maybe now you like him. He's woke now. He hangs out with Fat Joe. Oh, you used to hate the Cheneys? Well, now you love him because they stand up to Trump because apparently all you need to be cool is stand up to Trump. Um, uh, th these are, it, it's just very simple to get people to adopt different policies or to change their tribe if you use these cultural signifiers. So in my ideal world, domestic policy and foreign policy really don't overlap uh, um, um, as they, they should be kept apart as much apart as possible, which obviously it's impossible to keep them totally apart, but th there should be some difference between the two. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, just because it's so easy to to just get people to change their mind on things that they don't prioritize if if and if there's a certain tribe that they can join that changes their mind on something that that might be more relevant to them and i would say that most kind of uh, of the commentaria is very vulnerable to being subsumed into culture war and i think culture war is actually very useful to the woke imperium and to you could also make a argument for the economic elite as well, because it just gets get these people fighting back and forth on, on these issues and not paying as much attention to maybe issues they once upon a time, like in the case of Democrats hating Bill Kristol, uh, maybe were opposed to. So it, it's just a very useful way to divide opposition to these policies. And and I, I think Bill Kristol and people like him being recruited into the woke imperium, if you will, um, it just serves that purpose of just shoring up the fact that, oh, you know, like we can bring a lot of people together here. And and they yeah. are, in a sense, they're bringing a lot of people together. But I also think they're bringing a lot of people together on the other side <laughs> where, where people are saying, like, see through it and are like, oh, absolutely not. This is completely ridiculous. So these are the first people, by the way, who who like to talk about, you know, this 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 like red brown alliance that's coming and, and it's going to like subsume everything under some kind of like national Bolshevik, uh, you know, realignment. But whatever is happening on the ground, which, by the way, I, I'm not the person to ask about that. There is a realignment going on. I just don't know any think anyone knows where it ends. But it's in response to the real left-right alliance, which is the establishment left-establishment right alliance, which is for all of these things and is perfectly happy to pivot from, um, you know. Bush policies to Obama policies to, to whatever. Great um, and and they started the left right alliance and now they're going to have to deal with the fact that there might be an oppositional left right alliance against them. Great point. I mean, the January 6th um, hearings, if you can even call them that, the other side was never presented, were a perfect example of that where you have, I mean, Benny Thompson was kind of a stand in, but Jamie Raskin was the real guy. And Son of uh, Marcus Raskin, founder of IPS Institute for Policy Studies. It was a, um, and you know, the closest you could get to an anti-war or leftist think tank in Washington. I'm sure you're familiar with it. 
Um, his son actually was also a writer for antiwar.com and a, a really strong anti-war voice. And Jamie Raskin, since he's come into Congress, has been just a hard, as, as hardcore a neocon as anyone. I mean, at, at least echoing neocon talking points and, and you know, appearing at an anti-Russian rally as soon as he got into office uh, where I kind of questioned him and he didn't know what the hell he was talking about, but reading prepared talking points about Putin's axis of authoritarianism. And he became one of the main voices on January 6th, along with uh, Liz Cheney, the daughter of Dick Cheney. So that was the sort of left-right alliance right there, um, selling out the traditional progressive left anti-war politics that his family represented, the Raskins, and uh, selling in or buying in to the Cheney family, who are scoundrels. And Dick, I mean, the fact that Dick Cheney was never punished is just a perfect statement on how little the U.S. establishment cares about imperial crimes and the well, all the Democrats lined up to shake his hand when he was visiting the Capitol recently. That tells That's, you a lot right there. That does. I had forgotten about that. And, and, and this is part of what is, you know, inspired me to found the gray zone and what kind of keeps me going and I'll do whatever it takes to get in the way of this, uh, uniparty that's formed. Um, and because people on the right are also opposed to them, you get accused of being in some kind of left-right alliance, although I've never formally allied with anyone on the right. And I think, and you know... Look at this 21st century, how much do these terms even mean anything anymore? Like, on some level, like, I get left and right on economics. I really struggle to see it on many other issues. And I really, in particular, struggle to see it on foreign policy. I, well, it's I, primarily I just, on domestic cultural issues. I mean, the major issue that's animating the left right now and getting it out in the streets, at least it's organized factions, is abortion. And here's an issue that's a constant cleavage point between what's identified as left and right and also prevents uh, alliances, like just purely political alliances on opposition to the war state or to right. this escalating proxy war in Ukraine. Yeah. And I mean, I'm someone who has very strong pro-choice opinions, but I don't see why that should prevent me from making common cause with someone who is very, very on the opposite side of that issue. But we agree on foreign policy I, 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 because the issues aren't connected to me. And, and, and they're only really connected, I guess, if you view it in this totalizing way that so many of, of the professional managerial class do. But I don't. I think it's actually a mark of maturity to be able to compartmentalize and to be able to make, you know, like proper alliances to get certain things done. And I, yeah, I mean, I think the paleoconservative worldview on foreign policy is actually very close to being like a, a sober, proper view of foreign policy and people should look at it. That doesn't mean you have to endorse the paleoconservative view on social issues. I don't. <laughs> and yet I have published twice at the American Conservative anyway. <laughs> it, it, yeah. It's just, it's, it's just grow up people like like some some issues are in some places and some aren't in others you do not have to view things in a totalized way that's how the woke imperium views things that's how that's how the the bush's evangelism viewed things i think uh real adults can say we agree on x y and d let's work together on those and then you make a different coalition to work on other other issues that would have different people and that's just politics that's how it works yeah I mean, I, I have Scott Horton on from the Libertarian Institute all the time. Um, I watched the Ron Paul report. Daniel McAdams does a great job of breaking down foreign policy issues from the Libertarian side. He does, yeah. Some of Pat Buchanan's columns are incredibly sober on the U.S. foreign policy overreach. Uh, that that I remember Tom Hayden, before he died, advising that the left unite with Libertarians and Buchananites to stop the war state. They're, 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 the left doesn't have the numbers to not form these kinds of alliances over certain issues, but this concept of intersectionality makes that impossible because if you do so or you go on Tucker Carlson to make anti-imperialist statements, then you are betraying oppressed groups that intersect that are part of the left coalition because Tucker Carlson or Pat Buchanan or whoever are retrograde 
on you know issues of of gender or immigration it 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 so all the, all of those oppressions have to be and issues have to be lumped together constantly or they all fall apart and therefore a broader alliance which could actually challenge the uniparty on war becomes unthinkable on the left and you get canceled and antagonized there are even like certain voices in the liberal left who've made a career i don't know if they actually can get paid for it but it's all they do at their time and just attacking anyone who crosses the line and will go on a right wing platform to speak about the war state i mean it's yeah, become I, I think that's the part totally i toxic. think that's the utility of inserting culture war into foreign policy discussions, no matter what form it is. I think that's always the utility is, oh, but if you have a discussion with X, Y, and Z, no matter how much you agree or disagree on X issue, no, it doesn't matter because they also said this. Like, do I have to endorse the opinions of every single person I have ever talked to? Like, do, do, I, do I, is it, yeah. I mean, it's for, for a group of people who are so concerned with social atomization, like you would, think that they would do a bit more to not be the greatest purveyors of social atomization possible. But I, I deal with it constantly just within the left, uh, where because of social atomization and because people live so much of their life online and become alienated, their identity as leftists becomes so much more important and essential to them to maintain some sense of psychological stability that if they allow it to ever be challenged or to defy the left-wing orthodoxy and open themselves up to mass cancellation, uh, they would practically become suicidal. I mean, in some ways I see like the left as a, as like a basically like how they, there are gangs in the inner city for youth who don't often have families or need protection. The left is sort of plays that role for it has a cult like mentality and i would also yeah. say this about a, a lot of the alt-right too i mean Definitely. any any group of people where you see like a lot of anime yeah the proud boys avatars. <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah you, you you there's this like oh like the cult and they they hyper focus say on like certain media figures uh who, who become kind of like the cult leaders and then you know you have like the loyalty competition it's like a game of musical chairs like who can cancel who to prove they're really loyal and it, it's very similar to how like the disaffected like hippies in the 60s and 70s like became widespread um marks for their recruitment in all kinds of strange organizations uh that often had dismal uh leadership or purposes or faiths um i i honestly would not be surprised if you see a huge uptick in 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 a, it's not officially a cult but like cult-like behavior when it comes to political loyalties uh subcultures whatever just because people feel themselves much like in the 70s uh disassociated uh disenfranchised and looking for daddy and mommy figures in some ways and and willing to sign off on their um, critical thinking skills to just have a community and that's a shame and people people should be sympathized for being in that position but i mean don't do it <laughs> <laughs> you got to exercise your reason. Yeah, I mean, I've, that that's a great critique, and it's it's sad. It's a real tragedy because I think there's a major moment right now, as we witness the controlled demolition of our economies and the complete betrayal of working people, in order to wage a proxy war and wage an economic war against the world's largest exporter of energy. I mean, an acknowledged policy of dooming populations in the West by Western elites to fight some crazy war framed, I mean, I don't think there's any point in me playing the video. I think most people probably have seen it by Brian Deese, who's a Biden administration hack as the liberal world order, that we're fighting for the liberal world order against Putin. So we need to have these higher gas prices. And it's not this just higher gas prices. It's like higher food right. prices, inflation, just, just endless recession. Obviously, we're entering a global recession. Everything is framed as a cosmic battle 
of of you know it's and oftentimes because people are not historically aware it's a cosmic battle framed in like overtly fictional terms like you know mcu movies and like harry potter and stuff like and it's like this is like the time where like designated evil guy did whatever and don't you want to be designated good guy and stand up and it's like yeah but look at look at the world outside of europe i get i get europe being really concerned with the war in Ukraine, obviously. But this is my point, it's not everyone's interests are the same. Look at India keeping buying all their stuff from Russia. Look at the rest right. of the world being like, this is a European regional war. Meanwhile, the rhetoric from the US and NATO is, no, this is the cosmic battle of human civilization. We are we are the world. <laughs> and the rest of the world is like, actually, you know, like uh, we don't really like the war either, but like we have more important things we have to deal with. And we can't put everything on hold for this um so it's just people gotta contextualize like it's really really important <laughs> yeah and 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 just a little context about that comment liberal world order which trended on twitter it was made by white house official brian deese who is the former head of sustainable investing for blackrock the <laughs> venture capital firm that has helped design what i consider the controlled demolition of our economy and helped advise uh, the Congress on the care and the Trump administration, Steve Mnuchin on the CARES Act, which was basically taking our tax dollars and funneling it straight into the financial system and is benefiting from the fact that most Americans cannot afford to buy homes. It's just going and buying up homes, buying up property, buying up intellectual property, owning everything. And then it wants everyone to suffer more for what it calls a liberal world order. Well, I think there's a there's a huge opportunity here for an anti-war movement in the U.S. and for anti and for critics of the war state um, to to challenge this system. But we're not we're I see the anti-war movement in the U.S. at a very low ebb, and the protests that we've seen in recent months have come from elements that are identified, at least in the media, as right wing. Right now, it's the farmers. In the Netherlands, um, farmers are starting to protest in Italy. They're protesting in Poland, I think. And before that, it was the truckers. But there hasn't been an Occupy-like movement that's identified as left-wing to actually challenge this. I wonder if there, there will be. Right now, there seems to be a stasis as we move into a really dark winter. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to see how that will go um, and how it will be covered if it does it's it's hard i don't know i don't know what to say <laughs> um it, it's but i do think that there's an opportunity here for uh, there's there's a general i think there's a growth in people who just of all kinds i'm not even getting into details about specific policies but but there's a general growth in people that want a more restrained foreign policy one way or the other and we're seeing that we're seeing more people are getting published even in what is normally hostile um media outlets to that perspective so while the anti-war like on the on the activist side is definitely it seems to be ebbing and has been i think continuously ebbing since obama became president and you know ended all the wars he was going to end um but <laughs> we we but we have seen in kinds of like people commenting on foreign policy and offering alternatives. Um, like Quincy recently came out with like a, a, a kind of de-escalatory kind of stra grand strategy for like um, the US-China relations a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and, you know, we're seeing like this movement uh, at least in kind of like the geopolitics professional circles. And I think that's because whether there's um, anti-war energy or not uh, with the masses, I, I really don't know but anymore. But um, it, it does seem that like people just look at things and they look at the results of things. And there's more people that are like, if you just look at the balance sheet, this stuff isn't good. Like it's just not working and it needs to be scaled back on some level. It's objectively doing diplomatic and economic damage, if not perhaps military damage uh, to the US. And, and even outside of that, it's just, it, it has made the world a more unstable place in multiple regions, right. in particular in the Middle East. So it, I, I just think there, there is a general like consensus around a lot of people who have a lot of different views on things. Um, left, right, center, and, and not quite fitting in any of them. But, but, you know, there needs to be some reining in of the military option first, sanctions op option first mode. It just has to be 
more normal. Like, yeah, I, we get the U.S. position is so powerful and it's, it, it's literal geographic location is like the best you could ever hope for. It's never going to be like a totally normal country. But th I think there's an idea of a really, really um, almost uh, uh, anti-establishment shocking idea that the U.S. could just be a more normal country <laughs> with uh, maybe right. more normal ambitions about things. You know, not, not all the way, but a little bit more, sure. Well, we don't use that term normal around here and because there's no such thing as normal in postmodernism. Of course. Of course. <laughs> I would say make America normal again, but what would that mean? Um, and of course, we were never normal. But I think there is a strong isol I mean, I hate to call it that, but isolationist sentiment, the kind of sentiment that George Washington expressed in his farewell address. I wouldn't the kind of sentiment that. the Quincy Institute is named after John Quincy Adams expressed right. where the U S actually acts in its own interest and you see it. I mean, I honestly, I see it more on the right through these stickers that people are putting up on gas pumps where it's a picture of Biden. Obviously it's partisan and it serves Republican interests, but it's Biden pointing at the, how much you paid for a, a tank of gas. And like, I pay a hundred bucks for a tank of gas now. It's outrageous. And Biden saying, I did that. And I just think, you know, if the anti-war movement were to put up a sticker of just say with a NATO emblem saying NATO did that, or I did that, it would at least draw the connection that there is a price that all Americans are paying for empire and that sanctions that we are being sanctioned. People don't understand even what sanctions are on a mass level. Oh yeah, and Once again, this I, is I, a moment to educate the public about that. Yeah, uh, and it crosses from you know Repu Republican Democrat people at a certain income level are just not going to support those policies. Absolutely, I I, I recommend my co-authored report with my uh, coworker Arto Moini. We did a sanctions report, and uh, it really kind of describes just how ineffective they usually are, um, and, and how how damaging they can be not just to the targeted country, but to international trade with said country across the board, to alliance networks, even to the country that imposes the sanctions themselves. So uh, that that we wrote that long before the current round of sanctions, but um, it is unfortunately aging extremely well. Um, yeah. One thing I I would. Uh, State, though, is that the, the kind of realism and restraint movement that I'm part of, for the most part, I would not call it isolationist, um, because I think that uh, actually, I, if you haven't read it, I strongly recommend reading Stephen Wertheim's book, Tomorrow the World. It's it's literally a history of when US just, the U.S. decided to go from like regional Western hemisphere power to world power uh, as a response to the fall of France, like specifically in the early stages of World War II. It's, it's a work of history, but it does a really good job explaining that what we call isolationism really wasn't isolationist at all. It was like very much pro-diplomacy. It was very much like oh, defend yourself, you know, like have relations with people, also be prepared that, you know, the access might come for you, but it wasn't for hegemony. It's a key difference. And so I think like when we look at people like George Washington, who actually had the very nuanced view of diplomacy, um, he wasn't an isolationist either. What he was is he was for a, he would say, our geography enables us to have a very flexible position where we don't have to be involved in these massive alliance networks and these perpetual wars. We can choose to opt out more than other people, especially land powers that share peer rivals on their border. We, we can choose to opt out of this and therefore be a less militarized society. And I don't, I, I personally would not consider that to be isolationism. I just think that's that's sound, <laughs> that's sound foreign policy making uh, stripped of its, you know, um, uh, as over being overly ambitious and, and therefore having to spend way too much money on defense to uh, control something that is, I would say, beyond any presently existing nation's control. Um, total world domination is, is not a thing that can realistically be expected by any nation that has ever existed. And so even if you were to support this policy, uh, you would fail and it would probably drag you down. It would introduce problems. I mean, we we see many of the backwash of these problems. Police militarization itself being a, a, a example of, of army surplus and uh, people coming back from these failed wars. Um, we have all kinds of destabilizing factors. Uh, it, so, you know, it, it always comes home. These things come home, which means that I'm not at all a pacifist. Like, I think that there are always times where you know, one should not like abolish the military or anything because then you just become a target. But um, 
one should really, really think these things through before committing to them. And I think that we've created a strategic culture over the course of decades now. And, and in every country has done this when they're very strong. It's a hubristic thing. We've created a strategic culture where we just say, we don't have to think about it. We can just jump right in. It's time to intervene. It's time to sanction. It's time to invade. Right. Um, because are you a bad person? If you, do you not care about, you know, the, these problems on the ground? And it's like, no, it's, it's an option. It should always be the last option, the absolute last option. The, the, even if you do something incredibly successful, like, you know, be a victorious power in World War II, whatever, even if you do something like that, you're going to pay a price. And I don't just mean the people that die and get wounded. I mean, the psychological price, the, the, the logistical price, um, all kinds of things are, are your economy might distort for a while. There are so many things that can, that are going to go wrong, even when everything goes right, that you absolutely just have to be very cautious and very careful. And it, and war should be a last option, not the first option. And, and it just seems that there's been a culture, particularly, not exclusively, but particularly since 9-11, that says no war is the first option <laughs> or something leading up to war that could exacerbate it. And then or, it's or hi like hybrid it's war. Hybrid yeah. war is the order of the day. And I mean, we're, we're at two hours. So I just wanted to kind of make one last point related to your piece and get your response um, or, or you're welcome to respond, um, which is that I think there is a material element here in addition to a, a, a cultural and intellectual component to the class of class of Americans who are invested in the woke imperium and it's that they have skin in the game. So living in Washington, DC, you can see this and experience this on a daily level, um, especially if you live here for prolonged periods of time and you pass through gentrified neighborhoods or affluent neighborhoods um, in 2019, but 2020, those neighborhoods would have had Black Lives Matter signs on their lawns, along with other signs that were sort of anti-Trump signs where they were basically saying like, Trumpists are not welcome here. And they would say, love is love. We believe love is love. It's like the 10 commandments of progressive. We, we believe love is love. We believe in science. Or no, we believe science is real. You know, So get out of here, anti-vaxxers and so on. Um, we believe Black Lives Matter, we, we, uh, migrants are welcome, all that stuff. In, in 2020, on February 24th, a lot of those homes discarded their Black Lives Matter yard signs and their We Believe yard signs and put up Ukrainian flags. And that is not only because they bought into the uh, interventionist propaganda that positioned Ukraine as a bulwark of democracy standing against, uh, you know, the the onslaught of barbar barbarism and Putinist savagery, but also because Washington's economy depends so much on contracts from the Pentagon and from the various, in, you know, through, from the national security state. And there are so many, we, we call them the beltway bandits, so many firms, corporations lining K street, um, mm -hmm. also based out around Dulles airport in Northern Virginia that depend on conflict and their employees tend to be people who live cosmopolitan lifestyles and are very affluent. And so when the Ukrainian proxy war started, um, it was a pretty big opportunity for them to make money and to see their companies flourish. And I should also mention that um, Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin which have major offices in Washington, they're consistently rated um, some of the most diverse workplaces with the best um, conditions for uh, women to rise through the ranks. Lockheed Martin is headed by one of the most powerful women in the country. Uh, what's her name? Marilyn Houston, who's the CEO. And so I think the economy of the war state is... Um, something that people in a very progressive city like Washington depend on. And so there is a material investment as well as a cultural and intellectual one in the woke imperium. Of course, of course. I mean, th th there wouldn't be so much support for this if there wasn't a lot of money behind it. Um, and and it's the, bolstering this ideology 
bolsters more money in the future <laughs> if it bolsters interventionism then they will make back their investment so when these major companies defense contractors etc adopt i mean what i would consider like the very trendy current year um uh like hr policies it's a way of signaling you know how open they are to this and um uh it, it will always it benefits them in a very real material way. Absolutely. But we are talking the, the fads that catch on in, in uh, a certain class of people are going to matter more if that class has money to spend <laughs> and, and connections to leverage uh, in elections. And this is true across the board and it's true for both parties, obviously. Uh, but right now what we're seeing is this specific confluence of the Beltway Bandits, which way pre predate any of this, of course, but uh, then just yeah. doing their natural thing and 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 attaching on to the current thing. And um, that is the thing that they're going to ride as long as it makes the money. And then they're going to ride something else when, when that runs out. And then there might be some true believers in social justice who are part of this who feel betrayed by this change. But um, it's going to happen. And then they're going to be the more craven careerist types who um, just adopt whatever the next thing is and, and keep going. And uh, that that's what it's going to be. Any predictions on the next thing? Monkeypox, uh, infodemic, cyber pandemic, <laughs> um, war, you know, in, uh, I, war with China? Uh, hmm. You know, it's hard to say. Like I said, my original prediction was Ethiopia for interventionism. Um, now I'm That's not sure about that. It's still valid. It's still valid. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not ruling it out. But but it's clearly no longer the top thing on the docket. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to tell right now. I think so many things are in flux. Uh, just waiting to see how the war plays out and and and, and a lot of things. So it's really really hard for me to know. I think the long term focus of the woke Imperium is probably going to be China, obviously, because it is it is the the pro the only proper peer competitor to the United States right now. Um, and, and so I, I think that might be Chinese domestic politics might might become like the hip new thing to talk about in a lot of ways. Um, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, also, you're going to see specific countries, like I said, Venezuela, in particular, Syria, maybe um, really get targeted for like, oh, did you know this country has this thing that they've never atoned for or this kind of policy? So you're going to see the typical like targeting smaller countries that um, th that shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, I mean, one thing I do think, though, is that it will give way to something else. The woke Imperium will give away to some other justification for these type of policies. And I can't tell exactly what that is. I wouldn't even be surprised if there's a, a very big sweep, uh, like a Ron DeSantis sweep of, of the elections, if it's like a kind of anti wokeness in a weird way. Um, that'd be harder to weaponize against uh, the U.S.'s enemies for a variety of like obvious reasons. But I think there would be this kind of like uh, the U.S. is like back now, and 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 we're we're sticking up for like Christian civilization and all this type of stuff. Um, yeah. and, and it wouldn't surprise me if, if that ends up being its next form, or if if that doesn't really, hopefully that doesn't catch on. If it doesn't catch on. Um, it, it might be some kind of like more milk toasty, like uh, liberal permutation where it's it's about like we're just upholding, you know, the quote unquote liberal world order. We're, we're upholding the uh, countries with similar values. And, and we, we talk about the values, but without getting into identity politics. But yeah, it's hard to tell. I, I really think everyone's kind of holding their breath right now, waiting to see what happens in Ukraine. And then there's going to be a new normal. And then we're going to see we're going to see where it moves from there. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, I think DeSantis will lash out at the Latin American tro troika of tyranny, as we expect from Florida and uh, continue and, you know, ramp and, and, and continue the hostility towards China, but with traditional anti-communist rhetoric. So I, there won't be that much change. Um, but I, I would actually, it, my prediction is, you know, one of the future justifications for intervention will be on the basis of climate change. Um, mm. We actually started to see that around the Amazonia fires and the attacks both on Bolsonaro and Evo Morales at that time. 
That's um, an interesting one. I, I can see that. Definitely, I can see that. Um, and on one part of me is almost relieved that we're, we'll be talking about like a material issue <laughs> that, that can be like, but I know the way that it will be used will just be like, uh, but yeah. We'll no, see. I saw that. I looked at Greta Thunberg's arrival and her solar powered boat with extreme horror dr and dread because I saw where that was going. Um, but that's a subject for an, another conversation we'll have here another week um, exclusively at Rockfin. And, you know, I, I put these out also on Spotify and iTunes. Um, so you can follow my podcast, just search my name on any of those channels and uh, it'll be up at the gray zone at our, if, if YouTube allows it um, in a few days, but they, these are live and exclusive here. And this was a, a great discussion. I learned a lot Chris Mott, where can we find more of your work or find your past work? Yeah, I'm spread out all over the place. Um, a, a large percentage of my stuff is on the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy's website. So I have an author page there. Uh, it doesn't go all the way back though. So so it, it cuts off at a certain point and there's, I have more after that, but um, uh, most of my stuff is there. I have a lot of stuff spread out in various places like uh, the National Interest, um, uh, responsible statecraft. Um, and I have a link to my own personal blog, which sometimes is geopolitical and sometimes is not uh, on my uh, uh, Twitter handle, with, which is Chris D. Mott. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, just a variety of things. Okay, great. We'll continue following your work. And I, I really encourage everyone to read your piece, The Woke Imperium, and also your your essay on, on sanctions, which you can find at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. Uh, I'm going to close out here with um, um, a, a exclusive director's cut of the woke CIA ad that we exclusively obtained at the gray zone. When I was 17, I quoted Gloria Steinem on the Congress of Cultural Freedom in my college admissions essay. Gloria helped the CIA infiltrate the U.S. left through student organizations and cultural journals to prevent youth from supporting communism. Her story inspired me to serve in a criminal organization that lets me belt out self-indulgent spoken word in the language of the Salvadoran nuns raped by its Contra proxies. I am a Latinx managerial class millennial with narcissistic personality disorder who works for the sociopathic white supremacists that absorbed the Third Reich's intelligence services after World War II to and to today funnel weapons to sig heiling nazis in ukraine i'm an intersectional imperialist who pulls the lived experience card on white socialists who defend revolutionary governments in the global south and if you don't like that you are guilty of literal violence I infiltrated a fringe socialist party, generated manipulative identity-based dramas while issuing open letters, smearing anti-imperialists as tanky genocide deniers. I successfully divided the Palestine solidarity movement by weaponizing the Syrian white helmets and Uyghurs. I can change a diaper in one hand and hold a sign reading neither Beijing nor Washington in the other. I funneled money from a billionaire hedge funders foundation into a slickly designed pseudo leftist journal that slobbers over AOC, slams Evo Morales as an extractivist while sneering at actually existing socialist projects. I am a diversity token for a diabolical institution that kidnapped and brutally tortured thousands, including Khalid al-Masri, a completely innocent man, then hunted and jailed Julian Assange, the dissident journalist who exposed his torture. This agency attacked North Korea and China with anthrax, and if you think that's evil, you are not respecting my agency. See the nice old couple in this picture? I lured them into a van, suffocated them, and dumped them in a vat of acid because they accidentally witnessed CIA narco operations. I am proud to stand here as woke window dressing for the unaccountable security state at the heart of the most vicious empire in human history.